Hello, welcome to another episode of the Chrissy Mayer podcast. We are on, oops, fell off my armrest there. We're on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, and SoundCloud. And if you're listening to us on iTunes right now, please leave a five-star review. Guys, if you're in the New Jersey area at all, I better see you this weekend in Atlantic City. I'll be with Comedians of the Compound. We're doing shows Friday night and Saturday night at the Claridge Hotel down there in AC. For tickets, go to compoundcomedy.com to see the gang all there. Anthony Cumia, uh, all the guys you know and love from Compound, and myself. It's going to be a great time. And then I'll be headlining on Saturday, May 4th at Tiff's Ale House in Morris Plains, New Jersey, also known as the Dojo of Comedy. For tickets to that show, go to my website, chrissymayer.com. Plus, I got a ton more dates coming up. I'm going to be back in Austin in September. Uh, I'm actually also working on, I believe I'm going to be in the Chicago area on May 27th doing a one-nighter out there and plus we got a few more dates in the works looking forward to seeing you guys in person um yes but for a first a word from our sponsor guys we all look at this look at this music this is the sound of making money from crypto <laughs> Guys, we've all seen so many people making ridiculous money from crypto. But did you know that it's easy for you to do the same? The Copy My Crypto membership site shows you the exact crypto that YouTuber James McMahon personally holds and allows you to copy him. It's like having a big brother who knows what he's doing. You don't have to know a thing about crypto or how to invest. You simply just do what he does. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about James. He runs the Crypto with James YouTube channel, which despite heavy censorship has over 15,000 subscribers and 1 million views. Since March of 2020, he's told his viewers to buy 26 crypto coins. Had you put a hundred bucks into each one, they would now be worth over 20, no, $66,000. It's crazy. So much money. Of the 26 coins, his top pick of the year, a coin called Phantom, is currently up around 440 times from when he started. That one call alone has retired people. That means they can stop working. Guys in their 20s and 30s. And girls, of course. Remember, this is all public knowledge. You can go to YouTube and verify this for yourself. So if this is sounding interesting to you and you'd like to join the 1,300 members who copy James, then stop what you're doing right now and head over to copymycrypto.com slash mayor. That's spelled M-A-Y-R. You'll not only find proof of everything I've just said, but my listeners get full access for just $1. You won't find this offer anywhere else, but you have to act quickly because this is a special New Year's offer and it will expire soon. That's copymycrypto.com forward slash M-A-Y-R. Don't take this offer lightly. Yeah, get on it. Do, 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 do. I wish I could just listen to that music for, for a while. Also, heads up. Uh, my t- my <laughs> scandalous rootin' for Putin shirt was taken off of T Public. So I decided I'll just take all of my shirts off T Public because I'm not in I don't I'm not about censorship. But I'm very happy to announce my new t-shirt hosting site, flagranttriggers.com, F-L-A-G-R-A-N-T, triggers.com. You can get the Rootin' for Putin shirt and the famous Mayor Mayor shirt in a variety of colors. This $27 includes shipping. If you're looking at that and feeling sticker shock, it's worth it. They're very soft. People have been enjoying these so far. So check out flagranttriggers.com and get your Rootin' for Putin shirt. Confuse your friends. Uh, or I don't even know what it means. I just think it sounds fun. It's fun. Root, root for root for whatever you guys like. It doesn't matter. It's just a shirt. Okay. Guys, I'm so excited to have this gal on the pod today. Um, she is a political commentator. Um, she has a she has uh, been a contributor at OAN. And she's my first Brazilian on the show. So excited to have her on today. Julia Song. Hello. How are you? Welcome. Hey, everyone. Oh, my God, Thank Julia, you. you're my first Brazilian. And she asked, she was like, are you going to ask me to do to dance the samba? And I said, no, but now I have now you've 
planted a seed. <laughs> yeah, I'm giving you ideas, but yeah, usually that's what people say. Um, no, that, that must feel like I don't know. Yeah, that's probably the equivalent to when people meet me as a redhead, and the first thing they say is, "Do the carpets match the drapes?" Which right. I think, yeah, and I go, "Wow, okay, you know, you you might not be lucky enough to ever know." Usually, my right. answer to that is, "I have hardwood floors." That's usually my go-to, but then it I'm gets gonna awkward. Have to think of that one. Yeah. Harder for or sometimes people think I'm Irish uh, and they ask me if I know how to step dance. So I know how it feels. Um, Julia, tell me about, about yourself. Um, what is it like? You're, you're from Brazil. And actually this is a, this was a pinned article. Um, I know it's from a little while ago, but I just found it so interesting. This was on your pinned on your Twitter, how socialism failed me as a woman and ruined my country. Uh, this is from a couple of years ago, but yeah, tell us a little bit. How long have you been uh, here in America for? Um, it's about to be eight years. Wow. So I moved here when I was 20, so I was pretty grown up. Um, and yeah, yeah, I came here to dance samba. Really? No. Oh. No. <laughs> no. I was like, I, I so couldn't good. do that if my life depended on it. It's just like I'm just that awkward person. I'm yeah. like that person that at the parties I have to be holding something, like I have to be holding a drink or something, just so that I don't have to dance. Because like, I, this is my job, my function. I'm holding this drink. I can't move too much. I so. agree with you a thousand percent. I don't know if it's getting older, but I feel more awkward at parties and around like a ton of people. Like I'm always so thrilled when I see like a dog or cat at a party because like th I'm like, okay, that's who I'm gonna talk to if I don't know what to do. Right, right. I can't talk to you right now. This dog. Do you need a dog? <laughs> So you came here almost eight years ago. So you were how, I mean, you're young right now. So how old were you when you, Thank when you, you came here? Did you come by yourself? Did you come with your family? So I came here when I was 20. Um, I came here with family, but um, the biggest part of my family actually still lives in Brazil. So I'm sort of like at this point, a little bit isolated here. Uh, in this country, except for my crazy cousin. Uh, and it's a good thing, I think, in, when it comes to her. But it's um, it's very different in a sense that it's sort of like, so a little bit about me, background for your viewers. So I was just a kid. And then my mother, she was an attorney for the the opposition party at the time they were the you know they were what what people would consider here the republican party okay and the the governor um was you know she was working for the government at, at the time she wasn't really um political she was just to her just a job um so but then they lost the elections and the left started taking over what and year so, was this? I was 12. So okay. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but I remember like it was a very intense moment because from that point on, things only got much worse. And so um, back where I'm from is sort of like a poor part of Brazil. There isn't a lot of industry. There's mainly just tourism and um in the government so you have to sort of work for the government but she couldn't work for the government because she was blacklisted she had worked for the opposition before uh, so we went through a lot of um, difficulties this lasted for many many years many many years i went through a lot of difficulties um and then eventually i started to try to figure out exactly why life wasn't getting better um I, I was always like, as, as a child, you're always, you don't necessarily know how things happen. You just hope. So I kept hoping every New Year's, I was hoping this year is going to be better. This year is going to be better. Things are, are going to happen. My mom's going to get a job, et cetera. Um, 
but things weren't getting better. The economy was only getting worse. Um, so I started looking for different types of uh, reasons why. And then I got involved with political movements, etc. cetera, um, all, all that shaban. And then, of course, against, you know, the, the, the corruption of the left, because you had a, such a huge amount of power and money being consolidated, and you didn't really have a good way to keep people in check. Um, they sort of took over and, like, checks and balances were no more. Um, so it was it was very difficult to live like that. It was, you know, everybody in extreme poverty, extreme violence, et cetera. So got involved in political movements around the time of the World Cup. So basically, it was sort of like what um, started this movement. We were already, like, upset, but it was sort of like what started this movement was that everybody in the country was starving, the economy was the worst, but then they were putting billions of dollars into these stadiums that they were going to use once and never again. So yeah. we got really aggravated. Um, some of the protests that I put together, uh, that I helped put together, they amassed like over 100,000 people. But if you consider the fact that my area is extremely um, under the, the control of the left, that is significant. The same movement in other places like Sao Paulo, it attracted over a million people also to wow. the streets. So uh, yeah. Um, then I moved to the U.S. and I was like, thank God, I don't have to do politics anymore. I'm going to mind my business, you know, stay. I, I don't really like people, so I'm just going to stay. <laughs> right. I'm not, mm-hmm. like, I'm not really sure what to do with social media. Sometimes I post stuff because I'm like, I think this is something that I should post. And then people are like, delete this. Right? Oh, so if you, you like you it, doing? keep it up. I know the feeling, though. It's, it seems like as a, as a comedian it is so much a part of my job. And then sometimes I look at my social media feed and I'm like, I am sick of myself. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like I want to sometimes put pictures of other people up. Uh, <laughs> I'm like group shots. I don't know. I'm over here. How about a picture of my dog? But then, so I know the right. feeling of you're like, you don't want it to be like so focused on you all the time. I, I'm like looking through in your article because your mom was like a big deal attorney she's uh you said she was like one of the best uh yeah yeah she was the attorney that was working directly with the governor so she whenever he'll go um to do debates on tv she'll be there with him um stuff like that so they work pretty closely together which is one of the reasons why people knew her name after he lost the elections and so as soon as he lost and the other side took over, your family was blacklisted. What does that mm-hmm. mean? Your family was blacklisted. Like, what does that look like in your in your day to day? So um, basically, my mother tried. She knew that she was not going to be able to get a job. Um, so she used all of her savings to try to start up a business. But like I mentioned, uh, you either work with the government or like there's not much that you can do. There's not many industries or HQs in that type of place. It's just like a very uh, poor, barren era, area. Um, I mean, there's tourism because the there's a, a beach, but you know, as the increasing levels of violence and stuff like that start showing up in the media, it's not like the tourism industry was, you know, crazy busy. So. She put she put her some of her savings and started to um, and started her own business, servicing the government. She thought that way she could get around it. Like, it's, I'm not working with you. I'm just offering you a service. Um, but eventually, she did get a little bit ahead with that. But at the same time, it ate up all of her money. And one of the things that you have to understand whenever you have like a socialist government is that they tax you to death so whenever she wanted to get an employee it was very difficult because she had to pay so much money off pocket to that employee and she was just draining the savings so we lost our house we lost everything that we had we had to go you know live with different people live uh, be separated um it was all all kinds of you know 
we didn't actually have a home. So it was, she spent like many, many years trying to get around this. And ultimately her business failed because she was always trying to, you know, she, she did a lot of work. She did, she got, you know, as far as she could go, as she could get with the system against her. And it's not necessarily that particular state system, but just a system in general, like trying to start a new business is so difficult with, you know, and, and it, sort of that's why I was upset with the whole COVID thing where they shut down small businesses because it's like, if you're a big business, if you're Walmart, you're open, but it's so hard to have a small business. You have to pay all different taxes, get all different licenses, get all different sorts of certifications. And, and so whenever you're, you know, have to pay a place, have to get lease somewhere, get insurance, all, all kinds of things, right? And you're doing that out of your pocket because you're passionate about something. And then to be closed down by force for a year, that's sort of like, how are you going to pay rent if you're not bringing money in? Um, yeah. So, so it sounds like what you were seeing in, in this country here during COVID reminded you of basically like socialist Brazil. Yeah, it pissed me off. Yeah. And it's not it wasn't just your mom's business. It's like all small businesses are basically set up to fail because they just tax the hell out of you. And like and to like the idiots in this country, like I, I don't know, maybe briefly there was a brief time during college where I was like, whoa, yeah, I should get free college. And then you like snap out of it. And you're like, well, it's not free. It's someone's paying for it. But there, there's right. a, there's definitely a, uh, a population who, who socialism appeals to because you think, oh, everything's just going to be free. I don't have to, I don't have to bust my ass. Uh, like I, I, I deserve or I'm entitled to all this stuff. And people don't realize what, what a socialist society actually looks like. Yeah, um, I refer to that as sort of like having a cushion. Um, I guess you could say a stupidity cushion. Because, for example, if you go to richer parts of Brazil, they didn't necessarily feel as strongly or as quickly the results of those policies because they had, you know, uh, they lived in, in gated communities. They mm -hmm. had all sorts of things. They were going, their kids were going to private schools. So they didn't necessarily understand at first the impact that socialism was having on everyday people. Um, and then eventually by the time it impacts them, everybody else is already wrecked, right? So those folks, I, I refer to them as, you know, the people who have the ability to afford being stupid. Now, if you think about, the, about these people, let's say even the, the college folks, they usually live on, live on campus in big cities, et cetera. Now think about most of the country. Um, it's a big country. A lot of people have to drive to work and with gas being $7 a gallon, that, that's going to impact them more than it's going to impact you. Um, so somebody is feeling the brunt of those policies, even if you're not. And by the time it does get to you, then we're all going to be, you know, it's, it's going to be crazy. So I really hope that people can just not so much like look at themselves or what they want or what they think is best, but look around and ask questions. Um, there's sort of like a, a bubble that they live in and the bubble is like fed with brainwashing, you know, um, from the media, from entertainment, from um, academia and sort of like pop the, the bubble, go ask somebody that you normally, I, I'd love to talk to people who aren't necessarily conservative. I have a lot of my followers, um, they're leftists and I like to interact with them because it's beneficial. It's, it's not gonna kill us, it's beneficial. It's always keeps us in check with reality. So that's sort of like what I hope people understand. Yeah, because you're um, like, uh you're easy to kind of like approach. I mean, obviously this is the internet, like no one's physically approaching you, but like you're kind and you're sweet and you're like, this is my story. You know, it's like, uh, you're not intimidating at all. And I think leftists that are kind of living in this bubble, get, li <laughs> get living in this bubble can be like, Oh, here's this, like this girl has really lived it. And just because your mother 
was a lawyer and worked for the opposite political party as soon as the other side took over. You said you you went from my mom was a lawyer, which is a, fan, a fantastic job, I think, to have just about in any country. You went from like, yeah, my mom has this great job to homeless in a matter of mm-hmm. weeks, which is an ins- a crazy thing to go through. And yeah, and especially as a child. And mm-hmm. that must have had such an effect on you. I mean, was it was it just you and your mom or my brother and your brother? OK, yeah, so- my brother is a couple years older than I am. Um, there were several impacts like getting, um, I know I spent my 14th because, uh, over there you have to be at minimal 14 years old to work. So I spent my 14th, uh, birthday at the, um, you know, the, the clerk facility, the, I don't know what they call it here, but it's like a facility where you go to get your works permit. Um, okay. and of course, you know, I had to get in line at like 5 a.m. Um, uh, okay. great stuff about you know government funded type of things is that you get to go on a two block line just to wait for a service that you know i got out of there at 5 p.m like as they were closing they were pushing me out and I'm like i'm not leaving until i get this document just to get a work permit yeah yeah so my brother working my mom searching for things i was working as well and going to school was your and, dad around uh, too? Did you did you say? No, no. My dad and my mom they were separated, so he wasn't part of my mom's life at all. In fact, things weren't even better for my dad, so it's not like he could help. So, okay, yeah, it's okay. okay. And also, I am, um, you know, officially according to my driver's license, five foot two. Congrats! So I am a little bit short. And which means I am extremely feisty and intimidating. I'll have you know. You do have to be feisty and intimidating to make up for the lack of height. I, as a five three person, I, I agree very much. Right, right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have to. I could. I could be even. I could stand to be even feistier. I think. Um. So, how long were you guys homeless for? And and what did that look like? And like, where did you stay? And how did you, you know eat and all that um so that's sort of like a big answer so we were homeless um i was because the thing is that a lot of the times i don't i don't know if i can explain it in a way like if you say like i volunteer at the shelter and a lot of the times dogs couldn't be adopted because they were a bonded pair and somebody just wanted one dog, but they couldn't take both. But those dogs had to be together because they were a bond repair. Um, so it's very difficult for you to find a place to say if you are attached to people. So if I'm attached to my mom, if I'm attached to my brother. So we had to be separated several times. So I would go live with, you know, a friend of a friend or, you know, the streets or whatever or somebody will pick me up. Um, This one lady, she was, um, she was the aunt of a girl that was dating a guy who was friends with a friend of mine. Okay. And now you think about these places, they're not like awesome places. Like they don't have a ceiling. They don't have, you know, stuff like that. But I, I, I would sleep there for a little bit and then move on to another place. Um, but yeah, um, so I basically stayed like that for about six years until I was like 18 or so. And then wow. my mom, she probably like six and a half. Yeah. She finally managed to get, um, after all of that, she managed to get a job. And uh, of course, with the government. But it wasn't like a, a well paying job. It wasn't anything great it wasn't like you know this is a lawyer job it's sort of like a clerical job Hmm. but it allowed her to it was like a step down for her yeah yeah it allowed her to you know just have something of her own so that was fun that was so much fun think about it girl so much fun so many (laughs) adventures so you moved here in 2014 
And you said as soon as you got to this country, you were shocked to find America. Uh, to you, it seemed like a country yearning for the policies that my home country was struggling to get away from. How, yeah. In what ways? In what ways um, were you seeing that here? So in Brazil, I felt like I didn't have any other choice other than to get involved in politics. So I moved to America, and I'm like. Phew. I don't have to worry about any of this. I can just have, if I have a social media account, it's just going to be an Instagram account, share pictures of, you know, my cat. Um, nothing, you know, all of this is behind me. And then it was around um, 2015 or so. So 2014, I was getting my footing, it was late 2014. Around 2015, as we were preparing, um, middle of 2015, we were preparing for the 2016 um, elections. And I saw a lot of paddling from, you know, Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton talking about a lot of these things like, oh, we want to have free health care. There's no reason why we couldn't have free health care. And I'm like, girl, uh, I just came from this one place. And believe it or not, they have free health care. And uh, no thanks. Like, like, I don't want it. Like, by the time you were waiting in line out on the sidewalk around the, the block with, like, hundreds of sick people, by the time you actually manage to get through the doors of the hospital, it's like, I'm healed. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm yeah, healed or I'm over it. So it's like, it's like literally, imagine you guys like in this country, the worst thing we have to sit in line for is like the DMV. But that's like an hour or two, you know. Um, I think voting is probably one of those things. It's like, okay, you wait in line for a couple hours. I know this, especially in like 2020, we had to wait a very long time to vote, but it's like. Uh, those experiences it, are great to me. I just, you know, I couldn't even believe it. I took the whole day off of work because in Brazil to vote is mandatory. And if you don't, you have to pay wow. fines and then they start to, you know, all kinds of things. Um, sort of like you're not able to renew your passport if you haven't paid those fines, if you haven't voted, if you haven't explained yourself, even if you live abroad, which is something that I figured out later down the road. But anyway, um, it's mandatory for you to vote. So imagine everybody from everywhere just going to the same place to vote. Um, so everything is just chaotic. There's not really any choice about anything. It's just... You know, there's not a whole lot of freedom. And, you know, it's just to me, it's just it allows for a corrupted system and corrupt people to corrupt the system even more. And look, it's like here's this a very recent article out of The Washington Post. The case for mandatory voting of is course. getting stronger. This is something that is in the conversation here in this country. And whoo boy, it's like it's like everything you're saying that was firmly established in a socialist country is something that America is seems increasingly, you know, more looking into. Yeah, the thing with mandatory voting is like voting is already pretty cool. Like I went there and yeah. I voted, took my dog. We had a blast. Um, it's already cool. Like you're doing your civil duty. Whenever you make voting mandatory, um, you have to make a, a penalty to make something mandatory. It, it has to hurt people somehow. So how is this going to hurt people? Is it going to hurt them by fining them, by making sure that they don't receive a certain amount of uh, their tax returns or making sure they can't renew their driver's license? How exactly are you going to keep this uh, a mandatory thing? And so if somebody is unable to vote, then they're going to vote by mail because they have to vote. They absolutely have to vote. Um, the process to go through and explain your absence is sort of a little bit more complicated. Um, so to me, it's it's like, we already have a, a great thing. People do whatever it is that they want and it's cool. And if they don't, they don't. But like, why are, do you keep, why are you so obsessed with telling people what they need to do? That sort of, to me, is like a, you know, a slippery slope. And we're living on the slipperiest of slopes. So it's extremely slippery. It's like, <laughs> and especially, man, we already have too much mail in. We already had way too much, you know, 
too many excuses for mail-in ballots on the last ex- on the last election using COVID as an excuse. And like, I just see like if they were to make voting mandatory, they'd be like, well, we have to make it as easy as everyone as possible. So now it's like everyone is automatically sent it's like uh, sent a, a mail-in ballot it's just i see that as even more of higher chance of of election fraud or election borrowing fortifying whatever we want to say um because the yeah. more mail-in ballots that are out there the more shenanigans that can happen yeah it's it's really insane i signed up um so you see i'm like here hating on people um but yet i'm going to give public speeches and be around people just because I'm like you know I have to do something for my country you guys like come on and so I drove all the way to Atlanta to poll watch and then I just stood there you know where are you living now I mean don't dox yourself but like how long (laughs) where are you based now I lived at that time I lived uh in sort of like the middle of North Carolina so it's about a six hour drive Wow. Um, but I thought if there's a place that some shenanigans can happen, it's probably going to be in Atlanta. So that's where I go pull watch. And then I just stay there sitting on that chair, just looking at people and people looking at me and I do nothing um, for the longest time. You can't be on your phone. You're just sitting there just, you know, but um, I, I feel like all of this and, and it's sort of like, I'm free to do that. And I'm also free not to do that. Um, I I felt happy to contribute. Now, whenever you mandate things, a lot of people are going to feel a little bit like, you know, like it's a chore. And they're just going to rely on mailing ballots or stuff like that, the easiest way. And I'm sure it's going to get corrupted with, you know, seeing videos of ballots getting dumped, whatever. So, if you make this into the, the the biggest way that people can or choose to vote uh, from, then it's bound to you know display a, a a weakness at some point. So I find that the the more you keep things at their natural state and you don't force them, um, na- nature balances itself out. Like society. You don't have to have all these crazy rules like, you know, we have a lot of people in jail for weed or whatever, like society is able to sort of um, police itself without needing to have a huge amount of government oversight. Because once you give all of that power to somebody, what's to keep somebody a bad person from taking that power? Like, let's say you're making healthcare, uh, college, all kinds of things um, free. And so you have to tax me more. You have to take more money out of my pocket. And so money is power. So you're giving more power to the government. And now, assuming elections are are real, (laughs) you should be worried because even though you may have your guy now, what's to keep a bad guy from coming in power, let's say two, three cycles from now? and using that power that we just gave him so willingly against us. So I'd rather have that money in my pocket and make those decisions myself. And, you know, a lot of the times as as capitalism is sort of like a a natural state of things, socialism is, is more like forced, everything is forced. And so when you force people to do things, you're gonna have those who abide by the laws but they get crushed by people who take advantage of the system. So just chill, like just chill. Like what is wrong with you? Just chill. Just chill, just- right? And of course, these people, in, the bigger the government, the more power they have, the the more inclined you will attract people who lust for power and they will want yeah. to keep it as long as they can and they will want to And then keep Trump their gets job. and they're like, oh my God, I'll have to move to Canada. Like, oh, oh yeah, too. all the all the threats of all the celebrities, yeah, threatening to move. They still haven't moved. Uh, but they, even though he's been gone for two years, they can't shut up about him. So, and yeah. I, I just like I agree with you on like the the mandatory voting because like now it kind of seems like this privilege, this this like duty. You know, we get to take a day off work, most of us, to go and do it. So, whereas if it's something you have to do, it's like 
yeah, people will phone it in. They'll be like, oh, it's, it's kind of not special anymore. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that people are just going to see it as a chore, like filing taxes. They're just going to do it like, oh, OK, I have to do this now. So I'm just going to mail it in or go online, whatever. And it takes away to me the magic of it. Like whenever I became a citizen, we were in this room full of, you know, people who were also becoming citizens. And there was like almost 100 people, I think. And there was a judge, it was a ceremony, and everybody was so emotional, like people are crying, it was a big deal, everybody trying to take pictures with the flag. It's sort of like, you know, there is a magic to this whole process, like I believe I'm changing something, I believe I'm a part of the change, I believe in these things that I'm voting for. Now when you make it mandatory, it sort of like takes a little bit of the magic away. And if you account for things like, oh, um, let's say five, you know, five elections go by and during those five elections, it's bound something, you know, can I say bad words here? Yes. Shit's about to hit, (laughs) uh, bound to hit the fan. So it happens in every process, in every operation. If you think about elections, if you think about food, uh, like, you know, we're allowed a certain amount of insect parts in our, in our food, whatever, every operation shit's a bound to hit the fan. So you see your ballots going to, you know, the sewage pipe, somebody, you know, gone, gone, gone. It's going to come a time where you're just not going to do it anymore. You just, you're, you're doing something and then you see the flaw of the system yet It's like you have to keep doing it and nothing is changing. In DC, nothing changes. Your life doesn't change. Stuff don't don't get better. Gas is at $7 uh, a gallon or like 70. Inflation is crazy. So like, why are you going to keep doing it? You're doing it because you're being punished if you don't do it. So it it sort of like conditions the mind to be in this, you know, I, I I want the state to have less power over me, not more. Do they have libertarians in Brazil? Is that a th- is it a thing? Um more or less. Um not really. Not really. We're we're very, very, very much conditioned to uh we spent, you know, sixteen years with the leftists in power, so we're conditioned to government oversight. So mm. we have a strong um conservative movement there right now where people are a little bit less dependent on the government but we'll get there hopefully and then one day we'll be like full-on anarchists just good in the street <laughs> good yeah and look and and continually socialism is glamorized uh man this just came out god this just come out this morning yeah harvard hosts chinese official who said communist party of china is a great party Huang Ping touted China's efforts. I can't pronounce it. Touted, touted China's efforts to build build a great modern socialist country during a Harvard speech. Uh, and of course, anytime you see you know Harvard in a headline, like oh oh, Harvard said it's good, so we better all get behind it. Right. Um, this was a, like what? A, what is? I don't know. What is someone from the CPC giving a speech at Harvard? Like, get out of here. Uh, uh, find the title of that article to be hilarious it's like the guy from the communist party is saying how the communist party is great because oh, like he party. has a you know a, a gun to to his back like what is he gonna do he's gonna come here and say that the the communist party sucks and then his whole family is kidnapped back home taken to a a camp or something like oh no it's, yeah it's it great. reminds me of like um... i love it God, like I, I don't know if you're familiar with like Michael Malice, but he recounted like a trip to North Korea where like the only people that you're kind of allowed to see and interact with when you visit North Korea as an American is like everyone's like North Korea is great, you know, almost like this feeling of like <laughs> there's a gun to their head or they're just forced to say only specifically good things. And uh, right, they love it. You know, yeah, that's why they they don't go anywhere. They don't travel the world because North Korea is so great. They just have no reason to fly anywhere. And it's like, why is this? Ugh. 
it's just so icky to me. It's like, get out of here. Like, uh. Huang is a staunch defender of the CPC, has previously denied the existence of a genocide being committed against Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. I'm saying that wrong. Despite statements to the contrary by the U.S. State Department and the Holocaust Museum. But it's okay because it's Harvard. Yeah, you know, I sometimes go online and I'm like totally fine with admitting my genocide. You know, Monday I genocided. Like nobody has ever admitted anything. If Hitler was alive right now, he'll be like, I, what are you talking about? Concentrating yeah. about? I have no idea. That's how this want? sounds. This paragraph right here. I see these centers as a campus rather than camps. He said at the time, we get these people there to be educated. And this has been quite effective in terms of countering terrorism and de-radicalization. Up to now, there has not been a single terrorist attack in exactly four years. They're equating these Uyghurs to terrorists, not dissimilarly to, you know, what our own government was saying about parents who wanted to attend school board meetings or who wanted to speak up about CRT. And uh, now all this crazy trans shit going on so yeah it's just so gross like why are we like simping for china so hard it's because we're in bed with them like mm -hmm. real real bad like if you look at how china china is one of those countries where as far as i understand it and um you know take it with a grain of salt because i'm not a huge international analysts or whatever, but I've traveled the world. I've dealt with, you know, businesses in, in, in different countries, like poor countries, like Africa, Middle East, et cetera, uh, South America, Central America, and even here in the US, um, China is one of those places where they focus more on other countries than on themselves. So you see stuff like China had a big flood and yeah, sure. Like the government's probably gonna maybe do something about it, but they're really, really involved in the businesses of other countries, and that's how they make their money. So they have their hands on every pot, and that's what makes them so dangerous. And to find out that these people are actually coming over here and speaking to universities, our best universities, speaking to kids who are going to be our brightest brightest and and you know Our leaders yeah it's to me it's like you it's you know that what he's saying is not real like you know he's being told to say that he's being sent here to say that and if he wouldn't say that then someone else would be sent here so it to me it's it's just a, a whole cycle of like you know just think for yourself god damn it think for yourself <laughs> chill and like if you don't want to do things don't do them and that's it like go live your yeah. life and Stop and if you are people and if you're not on board with this you're you know you're thrown insults at you're a racist you're a bigot you're a white supremacist and even here american society has always advocated the spirit of diversity and inclusiveness and they equate it to diversity and they're equating basically like the slow death of america and chinese takeover as like this is diversity and inclusiveness like all this woke talk about like fucking equity it's all just bullshit uh but there are also some narrow-minded people i guess that would be us who find it difficult to accept those countries with different histories cultures and systems from the u.s he said they always point fingers at those countries and want to change them it's like there's nothing wrong with wanting to put your the best interests of your own country first and then he goes on to say the path of socialism with Chinese characteristics is rooted in 5,000 year old Chinese civilization. It is the choice of 1.4 billion Chinese people. Really? Is it the choice of every single person who lives there? Okay. Yeah, this is very propaganda y. Propagandish. I think I'm having like a stroke. Like, what are oh, the no. like, you know, you know, <laughs> Don't have a left. stroke. Don't have a stroke. <laughs> it's just so amazing. It's like mind blowing. I've had a chance to go through the Hunter Biden's laptop. <gasps> and really? Like, yeah, through yeah, it, through was, it? Yeah, I was posting some of the stuff that I found on it. And it's just very weird to me. Like, first of all, he is involved with business with China 
immensely. And I'd love to know how that affects, you know, our relationship with that country and the presidency currently, because there's a, a gentleman called Jonathan Lee, who is a businessman in China. And, you know, all these businessmen and stuff like that, they're very much like bonded to the uh, Communist Party. So this gentleman called Jonathan Lee, and they will have this uh, Americanized first names, which is like not really their names. Like this other guy is his name is Patrick Ho. Um, but I don't, anyway, I don't know if this is the Jonathan Lee. I mean, it, it sounds like a pretty common name. Yeah, so it's Lee, like L I. <gasps> of course, the more Asian way. And so he is asking Hunter Biden, um, and I, I've shared that. I can reshare it again so people can see the email exchanges between them. So he's asking Hunter Biden if Joe Biden can write his son, uh, um, what do they call it? a recommendation letter to enter Brown University in exchange for them doing business. At a minimum, that's sort of like, to me, unethical like joe biden doesn't know this kid he's doing that no. because hunter biden is doing business so he's like he's using his uh at the time his vp influence to get this you know it's sort of like uh, uh, there's a lot of kids trying to get to school and you're using your influence to get this guy that you don't even know into school because and it's sort of like if he does that what else is he doing what else is in there um there is this this contract that I exposed between Hunter Biden and a member of the Chinese Communist Party that he paid a um, million dollars minimum of a million dollars to Hunter Biden for his legal services um, in, you know, legal services. And what, what was the, the word I have to legal oh, services. Like a, a consultant. Yeah, and trying to navigate through the U.S. legal system. And so, okay, so Hunter Biden is not only a very great artist, um, he gets millions <laughs> of dollars for that. He gets millions of dollars for his business knowledge. You know, you think about Burisma, you think about all these different companies, how much money he's making. He's not a great accountant because he does skip on paying a lot of taxes. Um, but... He is also a great lawyer. I mean, he's getting all these contracts, millions of dollars. That's amazing. You know, I, I posted on Twitter. I was like, like some people, they aim to be successful at one career. This guy, he's like, while he smokes his crack pipe, he's simultaneously great at like three, four different careers, getting millions of dollars from each career. That's he's amazing. A triple He's a triple threat, Julia. He, yeah, he's a Ukraine uh, oil executive. He's a painter, and he's a uh, he's everywhere. He's everywhere. Like he, head. yeah. If you think about like places like Colombia, Brazil, Oman, who like the dude is literally everywhere, and that's in every time that he's in a place like that, it is in relation with a business deal that he has with China. So it's just to me is 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 amazing. I mean. I, whenever I, I, I don't look for legal services often, but when I do, I like to have crack addicts as my lawyers. I think that they are very reliable people. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm willing to pay millions of dollars for their services. It's amazing. <laughs> amazing. How did you best. get um, in a place where you were actually like reviewing Hunter Biden's laptop? That seems like super top secret. Yeah. Um, so there is a lot of trickery that you need to do because first of all, I don't know what's in there, right? When I'm getting into there, I don't know if there could be child porn, if there could be all, there's a lot of personal information that somebody shouldn't necessarily have, like, um, let's say Joe Biden's okay. cell phone number. Okay, right. Um, so, you know, I didn't really want the Secret Service knocking at my door. They might, but I didn't want them. You know, it was the weekend, whatever. So you have to make sure that these things 
whenever you're opening these things on your machine, that you're very careful with how you open them and how you examine them because you never know what you're going to see. Um, but then I just partner. I decided to just, because the, the technology behind it was so time consuming, like you have to go through, you know, lengthy levels of trying to protect your machine. Um, so it was very time consuming and it's something that I had to redo from the beginning every time over. So I partner up with this project called Marco Paolo and they basically have done a full review because we're talking about like hundreds of thousands of files. Like you have all of his text messages, you have everything that he's ever like emailed, all, all of his contracts, his pictures, etc. So it's a lot for one person to cover. So I decided to just partner up with them because if they're you know going through the technology trouble, then I don't have to. You know, I got more time to watch Dragon Ball. So, <laughs> oh, okay. And- so Marco Polo is a research group um, exposing the corruption and blackmail. Everybody should check out their website. They release a lot of this content, so you don't have to like worry about you know what you're gonna see in, the, in your machine. They come oh, through it, yeah. and they release what's important. So, okay, so this is Marco Polo USA dot org, a nonprofit research group exposing corruption and blackmail to drive an American Renaissance. It says report on the Biden laptop. Oh my God, I'm clicking on it. Ah! Oh, oh, okay, you can just click on this and then. Wow, they kind of okay. So they've sorted through a lot of this. Mm-hmm. Oh, Ashley, morning, Biden, Ashley Biden diary transcribed, which for how long they were saying wasn't real, and what like James O'Keefe? They, I mean, right? They went after him pretty hard for for them even mentioning it. Okay, wow, the cocaine saga. <laughs> I haven't yeah. seen that one. Oh my God, Hunter and Hallie. That was what. Uh, is Hallie uh, the relative or the um, the brother's wife? Here, let me read to you this one. Um, like a bedtime text story. that he sent. Okay. He he sent this text to a guy. Um, his name I have to, I have to open my Telegram channel because it's I don't keep these things on my phone. Okay. Uh. He sent this message to someone that I, some number that I'm not going to say because it's Okay, yeah, yeah, of course. I don't know who, who, but then this other person, Keith Abwell, who was apparently in a lot of trouble regarding uh, sexual predation. I think he's a a doctor and he was like predating on his patients. Like, don't quote me on it. I'm not, I'm not that involved in that interest too, but, but that's, after I reported on it, that's what people told me. So if you research on Keith Ablo and his scandals, you'll see. But he's talking to him. And he he's like, last name Ablo? A-B-L-O-W. Ablo. Okay. So like, yeah. I don't know if you can see it here. I drop my phone every now and then. But basically this is, and you can find this on my Telegram channel, everybody. Um, I repost it anyway, just so it's right on top. But he basically complains that he's not allowed to see Natalie. Like, um, she has told them I'm a bad influence and I endangered their health, that I have been sexually inappropriate with Natalie, that I have physically abused her, that I have emotionally abused her, and that I'm abusive to everyone around me. Um, Natalie is not even around, like, Natalie were allowed, if Natalie were, if Natalie were allowed to come visit me, I would be walking around naked, watching porn and masturbating and doing drugs in front of her. So he's saying that Natalie is not even allowed to be around them, um, without the presence of another adult. So yeah. it's, um, you know, it's, it's hard to great. believe. It's it's like really hard to believe. Like it's so easy. Like we've all seen the memes and like the the, the photos of him in the bathtub with the crack pipe. But to actually like hear the things that you're saying, they're like, no, these are his real texts. This is how he communicates. It's 
it's like yeah. kind of shocking that that it's so real and uh some so of those things are funny as hell but like, <laughs> yeah like this one guy he is talk they're they're exchanging emails about an event and then this guy one of his business partners responds i was going to bring a hooker but i changed my mind i'll be solo so I'm <laughs> oh, this is from this article uh this is a uh, fox from what december um, a few months before Joe Biden launched his presidential campaign, Hunter Biden was exchanging text messages with Keith Al- Al- uh, Ablo, his therapist and friend, in early January 2019. The book highlighted, because this is, I guess, this book coming out, Laptop from Hell. Um, okay, it's probably out already. Uh, they were discussing the Democratic presidential candidates, and Ablo said, your dad is the, your dad is the answer. Then later quoted himself mockingly saying, any man who can triumph over dementia is a giant. Think what he could do for our nation's needed recovery. So they're joking about him having dementia. This is in 2019 with his therapist. Yeah. Oh, man. He's not a great guy. Um, but it's it's amazing. It's like, you know, he, he doesn't even, it's just to me, it's a lot of it was like, Funny. I wish I had been drinking when I started looking into this. Probably should. If this were a, like a, your buddy's conversation, it's hilarious because he responded with, "You're such an asshole," but that made me laugh out loud. And yeah. Then Pablo um, went on to say, "Perhaps he can help us remember all we intended to be as a people, since he can now remember his address." <laughs> this is kind of hilarious. Oh God! Prompting to say to Hunter, his dad doesn't need to know where he lives because that's the only thing the Secret Service gets right at least seventy-five percent of the time. Damn. Good times. Good times. Good that's times. how our country is in good hands. So I can, I feel much safer and much more confident now. <sighs> oh boy. This um this one exchange that he had with his business partner. This is the guy that he does the most amount of business with. And then this guy emails him and says, Hunter, we just got a check for 21000 from Eldora, which represents our, our fourth quarter distribution from them. And then Hunter Biden replies, if you touch one dime of that money, I promise you. <laughs> this is like, this is just such a, to me, it's, it's sad. It's sad. If you touch one dime of that money, I promise I'll file a lawsuit against you on Tuesday promise eric no more of your bullshit and the dude was just letting him know that the the check was waiting for him and he's like a lot of it is hard to read because he is drugged up when he's texting so Mm -hmm. right but he needs an interpreter right um these are our political elites these are the people in charge they can sleep rest easy our, our government daddies are taking care of us. Not. I'm going to get to some um, super chats from Young Pei Chang. Some of what Julia talks about reminds me of what um, Rob K. Henderson writes about luxury beliefs, ideas that only the wealthy can afford because it would hurt normal people to put them in practice. Oh, yeah, like socialism. Um, yeah. Right, like what you said, Joe, the, the luxury of of, uh, of being kind of irrelevant, the luxury of being uh, kind of dumb and out of touch. Yeah, it pissed me off. I'm like, oh, like, like you, the, the, the thing that pisses me off the most is that they come off as virtuous. Like, the, I just care about people so much that I want socialism to happen. And I'm like, okay, um, do you care about the millions of people that this ideology has killed? Do you care the amount of people who cannot support their families because their business was shut down due to COVID? Do you care about that mother in Texas who opened her salon? because it was the only way she could feed her family and then she got sent to jail like like you you care about people in ukraine do you care about people in yemen do you care about people not like it's sort of like a selective type of outrage that's awesome this that's is my hundred right action figure complete with nightmares the real oh no <laughs> My buddy Andy Masterson sent this to me. He actually arrived to me in his underwear. And I was like, all right, this is a little too accurate. Without revealing too much. He just came in his underwear. And uh, Why are you doing this to your audience? Oh, no, older? they've seen it. They, I just thought you would get a kick out of it. All right, I'm not creeping you out. It's just it's, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Nothing creeps it, me out at this it, point. Anymore. It came with a laptop. It came with a little crack pipe. 
It's like a tiny, really? tiny, tiny. That's crack. awesome, actually. A, a tiny crack pipe, like, and I keep it in the box because, like, one of the dogs will eat it. That's awesome. Okay. No more. No, I'm getting. I'm giving you PTSD from the doll. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, from Krigler Show. Hey, these two ladies are both based. What's up, Krigler? Matthew Hammond, Julia is real. I have only seen her on Twitter. Thank you for standing up against the craziness. You are real. Thank you, Matt. G. Diddy, I don't know if he has any relation to P. Diddy. Chrissy, does it bother you that Natasha Leone is trying to steal your identity? Oh, he thinks we look alike. I feel like she's woke, though. Um, J.R., Julia has the best accent. Thank you. Do. It almost Thank sounds you. Icelandic. Uh, okay. But I don't know, like... I'm literally just basing this off of one Icelandic person that I know. King Valkyrie is a stupid name. Thank you for the super sticker. Um, so how did you come to start uh, being a contributor for OAN? Okay. So you just talk very loudly. And then one time, one day, somebody listens. So that's, <laughs> that's so easy. That's Yeah. Um, it's not very glamorous or anything. It's like one of those stories of like a super celebrity. They were like, oh my God, you're so... And then we find out that they were like uh, polishing shoes for a living for like 20 years. And then, so it's sort of like, um, I feel that like, I don't necessarily like a whole lot of what I do in regards to politics, but I feel like I have a little bit of a gift when it comes to writing and putting my thoughts into words and, and things that people can understand. So I just figured I would use this to make content, to write articles, to do a lot of things, to try to raise awareness. And thank God people have been able to listen, even though um, I posted a video today, people were complaining about my accent. Um, I see you guys, I see you. <laughs> Who will complain? <laughs> But yeah, it's just like not being quiet and just nonstop like writing and giving people sort of like the understanding that they lack because a lot of the news is like one way, you know, they come crafted, they come packaged to you and they lack nuance. So to allow people to see it from different perspectives to sort of like, you know, bring some of these things up that they don't necessarily think of. Like I had this um, documentary that I did with CNN and. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was like three conservatives against three liberals. And we were to discuss topics. Um, the topic at that, that particular documentary was immigration. And so the liberals had this idea of like, you know, I, I love this, I love that, I love people, I love puppies, I love rainbows, etc. And I'm like, okay, so you do understand that the northern part of Mexico is so incredibly dangerous that the military cannot go there. Basically, the cartels take over the control of that part because it's very profitable to them. So every single person that goes through that part of the border they go through the cartel. And when you look at the amount of women, they're being sexually assaulted. They are being raped. They're being taken into human trafficking. The amount of kids they're used as mules, um, you know, drug trafficking, but also gun uh, weapon trafficking, all sorts of different things. Like, do you not think it would be more humane to have these people go through a dignified process, then put to them at put the, put them at the hands of you know these different criminals who rape them, who whatever. Like we we've seen time and time again stories about women being raped every day by multiple men. Why do you think that that's a better option than you know having a good enough process and? We don't have a good enough process to go through, you know, if I were to, let's say, if I were to bring my brother here, I'm a citizen, I have a job, I have a home, 
sort of my home burned down a month ago. I'm like, I have this place that I'm in for now. It has burned um, down? Yeah, it did. Oh, it was no. Wild. It was wild. What, did so you leave there. a candle on? I, I don't even know. I was asleep. Oh, God. I'm so glad you're not dead. Right. That's that's what um, most people think as well. Most people. <laughs> like, 50, oh, my 50. God. You poor thing. You've been through so much. Right. Um, but, yeah, I'm at peace with it. I'm chilling. Life is good. I can complain. So, um, why was it, why was I saying that? Was oh, your husband down. Um, like Thursday. I have I'm, a house. Blah, 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 blah. Let's just lose that train of thought. Let's just. So you said you had a go. friend whose dad actually kidnapped his child. Oh. No, I thought somebody in the chat was reminding you of your place. Oh yeah, yeah. So like. We have all these different situations of people getting, there's a, like a line over here. It's not a, I don't have a forehead thing, you guys. It's just like a shadow. Um, yeah, just a shadow. Calm down, people. It's not like I'm not enraged Everyone, here. Yeah, everyone calm down. Um, But it's like, we've seen so many cases of women um, being raped, etc. mules of drug trafficking, like, oh, oh. Okay, I have a house, I have a job, and I'm a citizen. If I wanted to bring my brother to live here, my brother is extremely smart. He is not reliant on me. He has his skills. He has whatever. He'll be a great addition to this country. If I were to bring him, even if I sponsored him, the process would probably take around 20 years. Whoa. So we're sort of like, Instead of, if you want to solve the immigration problem, why aren't you talking about the fact that it takes 20, 30, 40, 50 years for somebody to go to go through the right way, forcing them to go through the cartel, through the borders. And then after they come here, then they're now undocumented. So it's not like they can't get a normal job. They're, you know, more subjected to different, you know, uh, um, people taking advantage of them, working them to that, like, all kinds of things. They're very vulnerable. Why don't we bring them? You know, if you really want to bring them, why don't we bring them the right way? And then you can't because it takes decades to process people. Now, why aren't you talking about that? You're talking about, you know, it, to me, it's like, and, and eventually um, uh, one of those people, well, the one liberal, the one guy was really old. Maybe he's like dead now. The other lady, she was radical, and we're friends. She's cool, sort of. Um, yeah, she liked me as much as she could like me. Um, and then the other one, the other liberal, is actually a conservative now. And she said some of the stuff that I brought up made sense to her, and she had never thought about it before. And then she started thinking about it and doing research and stuff like that. And realize that, hey, you know, if I really want a solution to this type of problems, you know, it's like if you want to help save the world, you have to first help your mother clean the dishes. Like, how can you I help love the country? That, that sounds the world? so Jordan Peterson esque, you know? Right. Yeah. It's like our country has so many issues, and you're talking about helping Ukraine. Like, no thanks i want to help america i want to make sure that it's just so much like hypocritical double standards like there's this guy he died um not a lot of ceremony around it me throwing this out there i'm not a great you know uh i'm not great at bringing up news and stuff to people but he died um and he was black. He was a young man, black. He was going home to his family, his fiance, his little toddler. Um, and on his way home, he was killed by an illegal alien. You will never hear his name. He he's it's like he doesn't even exist. And his mother, whom I got really close because I was the one trying to get her story out. She was working so hard to try to get some sort of justice, some sort of closure 
and the police was like pushing back because this was this happened in Raleigh where the the sheriffs got elected based on their promise of not working with ICE. So if the sheriff is not working with ICE, they have to be very careful about wow. how they, you know. So it's sort of like she she herself was a former liberal, but she started seeing all of these things and she's like, I don't I don't agree with this. And it impacted her life um directly. She was just fighting against the system until her last breath and then she died recently last year. And it's just, you know, overall very sad situation. Now the person who did kill her son is out there and it's free, is walking around. And we don't necessarily, I mean, we know his name, the name that he gave, but we don't know exactly, you know, the story. his past. We don't know, he could be somewhere else under a different name. He's just walking around. And it was a very brutal, um, like the, the guy that did get killed, um, his head was like a block away from his body so oh god but but you haven't heard about it right so to me it's like i care about it i i i was at his vigil i i met his mother i care about it why don't you care about it like why is it that this person to me it's like you know it's, it's sort of like they're just trying to virtue signal of course, that's, like that's they're not going to highlight a death unless it fits their narrative. Yeah, it's cheap. I don't have time for it. Like, fuck off. Exactly. It's, but you're change. It sounds like you're changing lives. You know, it just takes one person's mind, you know, to to open up on something to have a, an amazing ripple effect. So, um, yeah, hopefully. I like your style. So you, so when you say you were just loud and an OAN just found you if you're loud, like did you was it a particular like tweet or a story you had written that grabbed their attention? Girl. Um what what do you mean? Sorry, like like loud. how how OAN um like oh, how you kind of started um, being a contributor for them. So the way that I started was that I initially had a political Instagram page and then I got sick and tired of it because to me it's like Instagram is stupid. So I decided to have a Twitter page. And so I got close to some people on Twitter who at the the time there was a lot of censorship happening and accounts being deleted. So they and I already had a good amount of, you know, um, clout on Instagram. So I was like, all right, I will promote your Instagram, your new Instagram, if you promote my new Twitter. And so that kind of happened. And then I got a lot of um, good people reading my my articles. You know, you you gotta do the footwork. You gotta just email people, you gotta go after, you gotta say, hey, I just wrote something. Um, Take a look at it, What, what do you think? And a lot of these things, Unfortunately, a lot of these things they did not get published. Um, but you keep on you keep on going. Uh, there's this this one story that I thought was awesome, but didn't get published because they told me that it missed an an arch. Oh, an arc, a uh, story arc, arc or something. Yeah, okay, it, something like that, like arc. Like okay, I'm like I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> But thank you for your time. You're missing an arch. <laughs> yeah. So like, we don't You're like, funny. You're like low key so funny. Yeah, I try. <laughs> Not really. Maybe. Just a little bit. What would you uh, what would you like like to be doing? What would be your ideal situation goal wise or for your future? Um so sort of like making a lot of money off of Bitcoin. And oh. Then going off the grid completely, just buying a huge plot of land. So hard to buy property nowadays because like the realtors don't even message me back. They they're like, uh, oh, we're busy talking to BlackRock right now. We don't care about you. Like we have all these huge headphones buying all the property. Like, fuck off. So I'm like, okay, whatever. 
like, can I please visit this 100 acre plot of land? I promise. I promise I won't do anything to it. Be like, my dad is Black Rock. You don't know who you're talking to. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, sort of like just live off the grid, try to build my own house like under the ground with some soil layer on top so that the the you know heat sensors of the government drones cannot you know detect my presence and just have all these oh details but to me that's that's the dream right that's the dream that and to if you know him you have to hook me up uh thomas howell and um yeah. I, I have a, a weird accent at these words you know so and clarence thomas so okay yes okay hook me up Okay, that's to date or to meet or to interview or to just meet because okay. you know the guy, one of them is like 91 or something. So. True. Well, I mean, you, you never know, right? Guy. Yeah. You guys might hit it off. All right, the you guys. Wants what he wants. We're putting it out there now. Clarence Thomas or Thomas Sowell. Sowell? Sowell? God, I never know how to pronounce their names. Hook right. it up. Hook Julia up. We're putting it out into the universe. Right, come meet me at my crib, my <laughs> underground crib. Uh, underground, off the grid crib, off the crib, off the grid. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's crazy. Do you, God, do you see this turning around at all for America? Or do you feel like it's going to just get much worse and we're, we're going to fall deeper into socialism? Yes. <laughs> to both. That's not the answer um, I was looking for. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I think yeah. that things are going to get better before they get worse. But also at the same time, the work that I've been doing and a lot of those guys have been doing, we've been catching up and catching like onto what these people are doing. And we're sort of like reacting to it in a much more proactive manner. So I think that there's a lot of um, conflict that's still going to happen. In whatever way that you can think of it, like you, you don't necessarily have to think of it like person to person violence, but like conflicting interests, conflicting, you know, all sorts of different conflicts, like what you saw the other day with that Taylor Lorenz or something. Um, oh, yeah. That 65 year old woman um, who was, you know, trying to dox my friend. Um, She's your friend? Yeah, we're friendly. Oh, you! Oh, wow. Yeah, we pissed me off even more about it. Um, I would like to interview her one day. I'm sure she gets so many offers. Yeah, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna like take my headphones off because okay. they're out of battery. Uh oh, so well, it's okay. Some some, some scrappiness. scrappiness. Wow, yeah, Taylor Lorenz. She's wild. Oh, I'm hearing an echo. What was that? I think I'm hearing an echo. It's yeah, okay. I was <laughs> in the box, and the box oh. was like still going on. Oh, no. It's okay. We're about to wrap it up anyway. Um, Julia, I adore you. Thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me. Uh, where can people see more of your work and follow you on the internet, etc.? So everywhere, I am at Real Julia Song. If you type that into a social media website and you do not see me, it's because I'm not there. But I'm most active on Twitter until they ban me and on Telegram until eternity. So just go follow. I post some really good stuff, some dad jokes and pictures of my pets. I love all of those things. Uh, thank you so much, chat, for your comments and questions. Until next time, guys. Bye.